President Trump is releasing the final proposed budget of his first term in the White House. It allocates $4.8 trillion for fiscal year 2021. The plan would boost military spending to more than $740 billion. He's also asking for an additional $2 billion for a wall along the southern border. The president's team says the budget is pro-worker, pro-family, and pro-America. Over the weekend, Mr. Trump tweeted saying the budget will not touch Social Security or Medicare. However, the president's proposal will cut close to $500 billion from social and safety net programs. As a reminder, all White House budgets are subject to bipartisan approval from the House and the Senate. Let's bring in Paula Reed and Emma Dumain. Paula is a CBS News White House correspondent. Emma is a congressional reporter for McClatchy. Welcome to both of you. Paula, let me start with you. What more do we know about the president's budget proposal? Well, Tanya, the budget was just released. We've been looking through it. And as you just noted, this $4.8 trillion budget includes significant cuts to domestic programs and social safety net programs. Now, of course, we, we thumbed through to find anything about the southern border, and it was significant because the administration is requesting about $2 billion in Homeland Security funding for the southern border wall. But that's interesting because it's less than has been requested in past years and actually less uh, than Congress has even approved. But it's a reminder that the administration has been siphoning billions of other dollars uh, from the Pentagon budget ever since the president declared a national emergency at the border. But we have to remember, this budget, this is unlikely to be passed by the Democratic-led House. So really what it is, is it's an outline of the administration's priorities. Uh, this is their political message as the Republicans try to take back the House this year. And really what the administration has set up here is a stark contrast to a lot of the president's Democratic rivals. So, Emma, speaking of the uh, Democratic rivals, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is slamming the plan. She says, quote, the budget is a statement of values. And once again, the president is showing just how little he values the good health, financial security and well-being of hardworking American families. Americans quality, affordable health care will never be safe with President Trump. The American people sent a Democratic House majority to Washington to fight for the people to lower their health care costs. And that's exactly what we will continue to do. So, Emma, is there anything you see within this budget proposal that Democrats might be willing to work with the president on? You know, I think that, you know, what, you know, I, I would go back to what Paula said, which was exactly right, that, you know, this is a statement of values. This is a statement of, um, you know, a political messaging document, if, if anything else. And even Republicans are going to have trouble going along with a lot of what is contained within this budget. Uh, traditionally, uh, especially, you know, since we've seen the Trump administration come in with this budget, uh, Senate Republicans who control their chamber have wanted to spend more for instance, on foreign aid. Uh, Democrats uh, have wanted to spend more on education programs and environmental programs, and Republicans uh, have often ignored many of the administration's requests for certain spending priorities or, or um, priorities that have been um, fallen to the wayside in recent years. So first of all, I think that both parties are going to have a lot of trouble with the recommendations contained in this budget and are very likely to go their own way as they craft their 12 appropriation bills in the weeks and months ahead leading up to the next deadline to pass a government spending bill, which is going to be uh, at the end of September of this year. Um, as far as things that Democrats want to work with the president on, I think that one of the flashpoints in the State of the Union last week, where, you know, even uh, Nancy Pelosi agreed to get up off her seat and applaud the president, was when he talked about paid family leave. I think that um, you know, how you get there, uh, the gives and the takes, and, and how you find a compromise are going to be really key here. And Republicans are going to want to know how you pay for it, especially some of the fiscal hawks. But, you know, I think that's certainly one issue that would be a win for both parties that, um, you know, we could see hammered out in, in the weeks and months ahead. But again, um, you know, this is going to be a hard uh, budget blueprint for both parties to reconcile. And certainly there are not good feelings right now between Speaker Pelosi and the president, between Democrats and Republicans, particularly Republicans in this White House. And at some point, and I, I don't know when, there's going to have to be some sort of reset button if there's any chance for bipartisan compromise uh, up until the election. 
And, and Paula, I would imagine one of the harder uh, bullet points to reconcile will be this almost $500 billion in potential cuts to social and safety net programs. I mean, former Vice President Joe Biden is right now grappling with his own social security cuts record in the Democratic primary. So I wonder, is the White House at all concerned about what slashing social programs or trying to slash social programs might mean for President Trump's reelection campaign? Not at all. This is all by design, because while the Democratic candidates are out there talking about expanding spending on the environment, on education, on health care, this budget makes it clear the president is not on board with that. In fact, I was looking through the budget. He's slashing the Environmental Protection Agency budget by 26.5 percent over the next year. They're also talking about cutting the budget of health and human services by about 9%. Now, that's significant right now, Tanya, because, of course, HHS includes the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control, which right now are obviously actively involved in preventing a global pandemic as the coronavirus spreads. Right. The White House is holding uh, some briefings today on the budget, and they're absolutely going to get some questions on that decision. All right, so Paula, let's switch gears away from the budget for a moment to the post-impeachment purge. CBS News has new reporting on the role of Republican senators in the firing of EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland. What can you tell us? Back to Friday, CBS News had been reporting for weeks that it was expected that Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman would likely be pushed out of the White House and sent back to the Pentagon. The White House argued it was part of downsizing, but Vindman argues it was retaliation. His brother was also pushed out of the White House, sent back to the Pentagon. But it was a big surprise when just a few hours later, it was announced that the now former U.S. ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, had been recalled or fired from his post. No, it was expected that after Sondland provided negative testimony against the president, that there would be some kind of consequence for him. But it wasn't clear exactly what that would be. And CBS News has learned that there were GOP senators that were pressuring the White House and the president to just allow Sondland to quietly resign. They emphasized that he was willing to do that, and they didn't necessarily need uh, a headline grabbing a firing or ouster. Clearly, the president, though, did not heed this advice, and he did what you described and others have described uh, as a purge uh, on Friday. Though it's important to note, Vindman and his brother, uh, they are still employed. They're both working at the Pentagon. It's unclear that Sondland, though, even has a place right now in the administration. All right, so, Emma, after those removals, the removals of Sondland and Vindman, are lawmakers on Capitol Hill at all worried about who the president may remove next, if perhaps that he's emboldened now to remove all sorts of perceived enemies? I think that uh, Republicans are flying back to Washington today for the start of the legislative week, the first, you know, quote unquote, normal legislative week that senators have had in quite some time since uh, the lead up to and the duration of the two and a half week impeachment trial uh, of the president, which ended last week, of, as you know, in an acquittal. Um, so uh, there's absolutely going to be chatter about this and, and you know, quiet conversations among lawmakers, amongst themselves, about what this means and, and the possible consequences publicly, as we've seen in the past, uh, we're going to probably see very little public criticism uh, of the president and his actions. You saw some senators go on uh, the Sunday shows uh, yesterday saying, you know, someone like Gordon Sondland serves at the pleasure of the president. Um, it was within uh, the president's discretion to decide uh, who should serve where and in what capacity. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, even, you know, even even senators who said, you know, we think that the president has been chastened by some of these uh, allegations and, and, you know, hopefully he has taken something away from the impeachment proceedings against him. Um, I, I do not anticipate, um, having covered Congress, having covered this process for, for the duration, I do not anticipate uh, senators like Susan Collins or Joni Ernst, senators who said they think that the president has learned something from this experience. I don't expect them to come out today and say, you know, maybe we were wrong, maybe we, was, maybe we misjudged. Um, senators, especially those in tough re-election fights in November, want to move on. They don't want to keep litigating this or re-litigating this. They don't want to talk to reporters about this. So I suspect that uh, it's going to be very tough to get candid answers out of these lawmakers, um, particularly in the immediate aftermath of, of these dismissals and reassignments. I suspect you're right on that one. And, and Paula, before we go, the New Hampshire Democratic primary is tomorrow. 
But the president is holding a rally in the state tonight. Does the White House believe that New Hampshire is a winnable state for him? Well, hope springs eternal. New Hampshire was really the one that got away from the president in 2016, and our competitive president and his political team have not forgotten about it, which is why they are pouring a lot of resources early into the state. They're holding this rally tonight because they believe that it is winnable for the president. And even though they don't have too many electoral votes, they believe going into 2020, they want to rack up every single electoral vote they can possibly get uh, because they believe it could actually make the difference in November. All right. Paula Reed and Emma Dumaine in Washington, thanks to both of you. Thank you.